Hi, I'm Ken Gardner, Teledyne Continental Motors. We'd like to welcome each and every one of you to another General Aviation Accident Prevention Program. Our discussion is titled, Care and Feeding of the Aircraft Engine, and is divided into two parts. This will be part one, and it consists of full power management and leaning procedures and techniques. Before we begin, however, I'd like to take a minute of your time and tell you a little bit about the philosophy of your federal aviation agency in regards to these programs. They believe that when they're fortunate enough to get you to come out here and give your time, that they should give you something useful and practical, something you can take home and really use. We at Teledyne Continental Motors share that philosophy, and that's exactly what we're going to do tonight. In beginning this seminar, I have my own personal philosophy in regards to these subjects, and that is simply, don't just stand up here and tell you to do these things and not to do these things, because we're from the factory and that's the way it should be. I believe in teaching you how it works, why we do it that way, and then let you be the judge. So we're going to work on a chalkboard tonight where you can see what I'm doing, and the illustrations will help you better understand the things we want you to do. This title may sound just a little unusual to you, care and feeding of an aircraft engine, as if we were talking about a baby or an infant. But then, the aircraft engine is no ordinary engine. The modern reciprocating aviation engine is truly the athlete of its species, the ultimate in reciprocating power plants. Consequently, there are some things demanded of you, some things that an ordinary, lesser refined stock automobile engine does not require. And then too, some of the things that you will see in this presentation are different than you've been taught or have learned in the past. And that's really the ultimate goal of our being here, is to give you as much useful information as we can and to help you get more out of that investment in your aircraft engine. Let's go to the chalkboard and I'd like to show you something. One of the areas that we still have a considerable amount of difficulty in is breaking in a new engine. This is due to reluctance on the part of the owner to use full throttle during the period of time that the engine is new. We appreciate that concern on the part of our customers. He feels that this is hurting the engine or putting undue strain on it to do such a thing. Consequently, he is often led to practice slow flying reducing the power immediately after takeoff, or not even using full throttle during takeoff. In reality, nothing can be further from the truth. But to just tell you that isn't enough. I find in the years that I have been giving check rides at the factory when I was with Cessna, that it helps if you tell a little bit about what happened to that engine before you got it, and how it was intended to do its job, and the things that we expected of it in the early stages of design. So let's talk about something that will really open your eyes for a minute to the use of full throttle. Whenever we design and build a brand new aircraft engine, we are required by your FAA to run what is known as a type certification test on that engine. That's quite a test. And that's exactly what I'm going to show you. After the first production engine has received its production acceptance test, and that consists of the initial running and then the oil consumption run, we then start the type test. Now, every new production engine gets that test. But the type test is the very first engine, and here's what it really amounts to. We run that engine at 50 hours at full power. Now, when we say full power, that means max rated RPM, max manifold pressure. During the first 50 hours of that full throttle operation, the engine runs at normal cylinder head and oil temperatures. When we say normal, that means the first two-thirds of the green. If I put a green arc up here, it would look like this. The needle would be there in the first two-thirds. That's 50 hours full power operation. Then, 
the end of that 50 hours of time, we're ready for the second phase. Only this time, it's at red line conditions. Red line, cylinder head temperature, and red line, oil temperature. Now, if you think about that for a minute, we have 100 hours total at present. 100 hours of full throttle operation, of which half of that is at red line conditions. If you were to try to duplicate that, you would have to fly your engine six minutes at full power, every hour for a thousand hours to equal that. You probably never will. That's not the end of the test. We run the engine for another 50 hours at 65 to 75 percent power and again at red line condition. So this red line condition that we put up here involves 100 hours of operation. Now, if we only ran the engine, the minimum FAA requirement, that would still total 150 hours of the most grueling operation you can imagine. 100 of it at full throttle and 100 of it at red line condition. We exceed that. Most engine manufacturers do by a considerable margin. But this is where the real acid test is determined. That would seem to be enough for the average person. In fact, probably more than that. But now, we take the engine completely apart at the end of the type test and determine if there was anywhere at all, and there can be none. Before we put that engine together, and mind you, it's a production engine, we kept a record by measuring every part because there are production tolerances. And I think you know what that means. The piston can be plus or minus a half thousand or a thousand, depending on the blueprint tolerances. And so in order that we would know exactly what happened in this type engine, as we assembled the engine, we measured every piece, wrote down the exact measurements on each piece that moved. We kept a record or log sheet of that. At the end of the type test, when the engine is disassembled, all those parts are again measured. If there was any appreciable wear, then the engine failed its type test. So what this means to you, the pilot, the engine successfully endured the type test and with no appreciable wear. Now, if you had any thoughts or feelings that you were going to hurt the engine, this should convince you that that isn't really the case. In all of that time, running at full power, 100 hours, and 100 hours at redline conditions, it didn't do anything to the engine in terms of even wear, let alone damage. So you see, it was built for the job that we're asking you to do with it. It was designed to operate at those power conditions. While it's true that we don't recommend that you operate the engine at red line cylinder head and oil temperatures, it could in an emergency, and it was designed to do that without failure. We recommend two-thirds of the green for normal operating temperatures. But there's more than that. That's the first engine. Now let's talk about your engine. Maybe you picked up a new airplane at the factory. And so you have the pleasant experience of breaking that engine in. We want you to use full throttle on that engine for every takeoff, and especially for the first 100 hours, because that is the critical break-in period of that engine's life. We would like very much if you opened the throttle all the way on the end of the runway, and you held it there until that airplane attained at least 400 feet above the runway from which you departed before you attempted to make any power reduction at all. There are good reasons for that. You know now that the engine was designed for it. You're not going to hurt it. Let me show you some of the things that you should know that will help you understand why we ask these things. One of these is how well the engine is going to break in, and you determine that. Now, we did it for you initially at the factory when we ran the production test. Part of that test included a run at full throttle, which we call the oil consumption run. The amount of time varies with different engines, depending on production experience that we have attained to tell us how long that should be. 
But the next 50 to 100 hours are the most critical period in that engine's life. Failure to use full throttle and heavy power can result in a poor break-in, high oil consumption, and dissatisfaction for you. Let me show you what really happens. To illustrate this, I'm going to show you some of the things that are inside the engine or what they really look like. Let's take a cylinder, for example. This being the cylinder wall of the engine, looking at it as if it were cut away. Throughout the bore on that cylinder wall are a series of scratches, deliberately scratched in a diamond-shaped pattern that we call cross-hatching. Now, here's what that would look like from a side view because that's how we're going to use it. And I'm going to grossly exaggerate this for illustration purposes. This would be a cutaway section of the side of the cylinder wall. These scratches form little valleys and peaks. We'll put the piston ring up here next. It, too, has little saw teeth edges on it. And again, now, this is grossly exaggerated for illustration purposes. Here's the piston, the ring groove, and we'll just use one piston ring for our illustration. Between the piston ring and the cylinder wall is a film of lubricating oil. That is how the engine would look when you get it. Well, you can see that this doesn't provide any smooth surface like you're accustomed to seeing and believing. But in order for that ring to take the same shape that the cylinder wall has and wear in so that you have a good engine, that uses very little oil, has a good gas-tight seal between the piston rings, it is necessary for this piston ring and cylinder wall to take a shape or to mate each other that involves some wear. In order to get that to happen, this piston ring must break through that oil film or rupture it and make metal to metal contact with the cylinder wall. Startling, isn't it? but well, that's the way it really is. That's true in your automobile engine as well. The piston ring itself, although it has a certain amount of elasticity, isn't powerful enough to rupture that oil film. You must do it. And the way you do it is with pressure in the combustion chamber. We describe that pressure as BMEP, which stands for brake mean effective pressure, but translated to our language, that's the push that makes the piston go down, the pressure. Those, some of those gases escape past the top of the piston, and they get down in here. And some of them go right down through here. We want to stop as much of that as possible, and it will when the ring breaks in and takes the shape of the cylinder wall. But some of it also goes back in here, forcing the ring down tight on its land. And it comes around like this, and this is the secret. Back here, the gases push the ring hard enough to rupture the oil film and make metal-to-metal -metal contact, causing these little peaks to wear off, like this, and on the piston ring, so that a well-heeled-in ring would eventually look like this, and the cylinder wall. And as time goes on, they wear down a little more. That is the ideal situation. That takes high power. In fact, it happens best above 75% power. That's why we recommend full throttle in every takeoff as being extremely critical on a new engine. We also recommend that you cruise that new engine at 65 and 75% power as much as possible. This often means cruising at a lower altitude than you planned, but during the first 50 to 100 hours, that's vitally important. If you don't do that, and you baby the engine and slow fly it, then this is what will happen. Each time that cylinder wall is exposed to the hot gases of previous combustion, a certain amount of this oil film will vaporize off. Well, above the piston, if it were down here at this time, let me show you exactly how that happens. We'll just move our piston down. This vapor will ignite and flash over. That's a common phenomenon. We're aware of that. And it's normal and causes no trouble if the engine is properly broken in. 
But under slow flight and bathing conditions, when this oil does flash off, it creates ash or residue. That filters down through the oil into these grooves or valleys. It only takes about 50 hours of slow flying under these conditions with an unbroken in engine until these little valleys start to fill up. And if they get out here to where they completely cover up the peaks and the valleys and make a perfect straight wall, which will exist once the engine is broken in, no more break-in will occur. It will be very difficult to get a metal-to-metal -metal contact. Now the engine isn't broken in yet, and it never will under those circumstances. Now you have a high oil consumption engine and one that also uses a lot of fuel. Excessive blow by which contaminates the oil and will soon stick the rings. See what I mean? The use of high throttle and heavy power during that first 50 to 100 hours will eliminate that problem. Will produce the proper break in. In these sessions that follow, we'll use that same illustration again. You'll see that there are other things that are very important that we ask you not to do or to do that are tied directly into this illustration we just showed you. That's break-in and those rules apply to a brand new engine, a remanufactured engine, an overhauled engine, whether factory or field, and even a cylinder replacement. If you replace just one cylinder on the aircraft engine, then that cylinder has to break in again. So it's important that you pay attention to the break-in rules and repeat what you did during the first 50 to 100 hours for the benefit of that one cylinder. Now, most people feel that after that 50 to 100 hours, that's it. They can relax now. And you can, really, up to a point. Remember that this is a hot gas expansion engine. It works best when the temperatures are up, and the way you get them up there is lots of power. And then to the airplane, it's principally a speed merchant. And that's what the engine's designed for, to pull it fast. So you really don't get that if you're cruising at low power settings. Low power settings also result in the parts contracting because the piston is aluminum. And its expansion and uh, contraction coefficient is a little better than three times that of steel. So when you cruise at low power settings, you cause the piston to contract and become smaller. Contrary to popular belief, it's harder on the engine because those parts have more clearances, therefore they move around more. When the engine's running at 65% power, the pistons are operating at a much higher temperature, the clearances are less than they are at lower temperatures, and so wear is reduced under those circumstances. There again is something that's contrary to popular belief. Now let's talk about full throttle from some other standpoints. When the engines broke in, and the first 50 to 100 hours are over and a thing of the past now and everything's running smoothly, you may think that it's not necessary to do this anymore and that full power really isn't required. And I know that that is a little difficult getting used to, is in a sense putting the spurs to that engine. But you saw earlier that that really isn't the case. It's not going to wear it out or hurt it. But well, let's consider some of the other things that we built into the engine and the reasons why we want full power on every takeoff and that we like to see high power use. But right now we'll talk about full power because you can, after that first 50 to 100 hours, fly the airplane at 45%, 55% for economy reasons, which you may often want to do. But now we'll talk about full power on takeoff. We always want full throttle on takeoff, regardless of the circumstances. There are a lot of reasons. One of them, probably the most simplest one of all, is a safety factor. Let's look at that. Here's a runway. You start here with an airplane. We run this distance, we'll say, and takeoff is affected here. Out about here at full power, we obtain 400 feet of altitude above that particular runway. Now let's do the same thing, and this time uh, less than full throttle. And start back here again, we'll call this airplane A at full power. All right, this second one is going to be considerably less. Or maybe we opened the throttle to full and we ran down here. And right about the time we got this point rotated, we reduced the power. Now we're going to go way out here before we get that 400 feet. See the amount of time differential 
that you exposed yourself to hazard if you didn't have altitude and something happened. So by using full throttle so you obtain at least 400 feet above the departing runway, you guarantee yourself that you will reach a safe altitude where you have time to do something if you did have difficulties as compared to this where it's much less. You have reduced the time and therefore increased the safety for you. That in itself should be reason enough. But there's other reasons that affect the engine. And since your concern may be for possible damage to the engine, let's talk about those. I want to tell you a little bit about detonation because it's been my experience in my travels that many people are really unfamiliar with what that is. They know it's something bad. And most people have the feeling, most pilots feel that this is the result of using fuel of too low an octane for the engine, and that's correct. But you can get detonation in an aircraft engine using the correct grade of fuel by three distinct operating procedures. One is over boost. Here's what that amounts to. Engine's running at 2300 RPM. You're pulling 26 inches manifold pressure. That's an overboost condition. Now we're talking about naturally aspirated engines, not supercharged or turbocharged engines. So you can experience an overboost condition even with the correct rate of fuel and on a non-supercharged engine. We have a rule of thumb for engines with the exception of the early E-series engines that were used in the Beechcraft Bonanza. Those engines are the 165, 185, and 225 horse engines, known commonly as the E-series engines. With the exception of those engines, starting with the 0470 series and going all the way up through the 520 series, non-supercharged, mind you, we recommend no more than two inches above the RPM. So if you're running at 2300 RPM, 25 inches is the maximum overboost condition that the engine likes to see. Now there are times when you may forget that. Maybe you took off at full power and you reduced the RPM after takeoff and neglected to reduce the manifold pressure and an overboost condition exists. And there's a multitude of situations where this can happen. We recognize that. And therefore, to prevent Protect you against detonation, we have something built into the engine for this purpose, but it only works at full throttle. So let's talk about the other two conditions. Another one is overheated engine. I misspelled that, didn't I? And excessive lean. Excessive leaning. Now you have all three of those under your control. You can cause an overboost. You can experience an overheated engine. For example, long delay at the end of the runway on a hot summer day, waiting your turn to take off. And excessive leaning. We realize that, and we don't want you to have to taxi back and let the engine cool down, or worry about this situation too much. So a system was built into the engine to protect you that works on the full power condition. Now I like to say this before we go on. These three conditions are prevalent at 75% power and above. Below that, it's not much of a worry. So we're talking primarily in the high power range, which is where you operate quite a bit in takeoff and climb, and often at cruise. Now let's talk about the system we designed into the airplane to protect you. The first detonation of what it really is. This is a cylinder, the piston, and a combustion chamber. Two spark plugs on each side. When the mixture is ignited, a flame front travels across the combustion chamber like this. We call that propagation. Contrary to what you might have been told, the gasoline does not explode. The fuel-air mixture is drawn into the engine, compressed, ignited, and it burns smoothly and under control, traveling across the combustion chamber in this manner. As it does, 
the part that has not yet burned is subject to a temperature and pressure increase from this flame front that is right next to it. If that unburned portion right there should reach its own self-ignition temperature, it will explode with a tremendous force that releases heat energy and pressure too quickly, much too quickly for the engine. Under those circumstances, you have detonation, and that's what it is in the true sense of the word. It can be heard in your automobile engine when you have fuel in there that is of too low an octane or when the time is incorrectly set. But you can hear it, so you let up on the throttle and it goes away. It can rarely, if ever, be heard in an aviation engine above the sound of the propeller and exhaust. And you have a different set of circumstances. You can't just back off on the throttle on a takeoff and ease up. So we protect you against that with another system designed into the engine. On a carburetor engine, there's a system called a back suction economizer. Now that works this way. When the throttle is above 75%, Let's say it's 76 it opens. This system goes to work for you and it changes the mixture ratio from normal 8 to 1 to a 6 to 1 or super rich mixture. On a fuel injection engine, it's accomplished by the cam in the fuel metering system. That added fuel that reaches the combustion chamber has the effect as if you used a higher octane fuel. And it works like this. The extra fuel which won't burn, must be vaporized anyway. And the heat does that. Naturally, that's going to happen. In a process of vaporization, that rich mixture absorbs some of the heat energy in the combustion chamber, lowering the temperature slightly. And in effect, that gives you protection as if you had a higher octane number. Then two, the fuel, 80 over 87, for example, that's full rich mixture performance, lean performance. So when the mixture is lean, the engine is experiencing from its fuel an 80 octane protection. But when the mixture is rich, the protection is equivalent to 87. We'll use that again in the leaning technique. There's another good reason why the throttle should always be open on takeoff to ensure that mixture. Now it's true that on a constant speed propeller, you can set up your power and know exactly what it is because you have a manifold pressure as well as a tachometer. But on a fixed pitch airplane, you really don't know. Therefore, when you pull a throttle back, you may pull it back far enough to close the economizer system or eliminate your protection. We even recommend climbing fixed pitch installations with engines such as the O200 and the O300 at full throttle all the way to your cruising altitude. I realize that that is a little bit hard to swallow sometimes for people who really take care of their engines, but it won't hurt the engine. And all we ask when you do that is be generous with the cooling air flow over the engine, and you should do that anyway, especially in a climb. And be generous with the mixture control. As the outside air temperature goes up in approaching summer months and during hot summer weather, Shallow out the angle of climb so that you get more cooling air because there's less, less differential between the temperature of the air and the engine temperature, which is always going to be the same because that doesn't change. Fuel burns at a specific temperature. The heat liberator will be whatever amount of fuel you're burning. But as the outside temperature warms up, you have less capacity in the air to absorb that heat or less differential. So shallow out the angle of climb in hot weather. But don't be afraid to use full throttle and especially because the engine is now broke in and you feel it isn't necessary. These are the advantages that are working for you when you do that. Then there's another one. All of our engines use a yardstick that we work from, some reference point that we measure horsepower from. We call this ISA, in standard atmosphere. This is what it means. 29.92 inches of mercury and 
degrees Fahrenheit. That's the yardstick by which performance of engines is measured. And they're very sensitive to density and temperature. That engine is rated at its horsepower at those conditions. Let's use an example and I'll show you exactly what I mean. Here's an engine of 285 horsepower. Now let's affect the takeoff at zero degrees Fahrenheit. The air is going to be more dense at zero degrees Fahrenheit than it was at 59 degrees. Therefore, the pressure in the combustion chamber is going to be greater. In fact, it's true, the engine will develop more than 285 horsepower under those conditions. Not a great deal, but it will exceed that figure there. We realize that. The engine's strong enough for that, it can take it. There's no problem. But the fuel, how about the fuel? That remains, in this case, 100 over 130. It doesn't change. Therefore, some compensation must be made so as not to take away the margin that we have in protection against detonation. Again, the super rich mixture obtained with full throttle opening does that job for you. See that now? There's quite a few reasons working for you. Quite a few safety factors built in there that take away the pain and the complexity and the degree of knowledge that you would have to know and understand the engine in order to avoid these conditions I just described. But you only get it when the throttle is in the full open position. You only need it at 75%, above 75% power. You're probably asking this one last question. What about when the engine starts to get old? Okay, good point. The TBO, or time between overhaul, is predicated on how long the engine can operate under normal conditions and retain its health, not how long it will operate which many people think. So an engine with a 1,500-hour TBO, and providing it receives a 100-hour inspection, which it should every 100 hours, will operate right up to 1,500 hours as a rule without losing its health. By the time it gets to 1,500 hours, we feel that that's enough. Now it's time to overhaul the engine. Sometimes they even have to be top before that, depending on the conditions they operate under. And I'll explain that to you in part two. But there should be no need to fear operating at full throttle all the way up to TBO. Because if the engine's healthy and your mechanic determines that, then nothing's going to happen. The engine doesn't lose its strength as it gets old, only its efficiency. So full throttle is only a matter of pressure. And since the parts remain unchanged strength-wise, you aren't losing anything. Well, that should give you some insight now into full throttle operation and why we recommend it. Another area of concern is during takeoff and how fast the throttle should be opened. Our manuals all say that the throttle should be opened smoothly and rapidly and that the engine's ready for takeoff, regardless of the ambient or outside temperatures, as soon as it will accept a smooth, rapid throttle application to the full position without hesitation or coughing or sputtering and with the temperature and pressures in the green, like oil pressure and oil temperature. Now you can't always do that on an oil temperature because in the winter time, and especially on engines without oil radiators, they won't be up there. But if the needle's off the peg and the oil pressure does not exceed the red line and it does accept the throttle smoothly when I say smoothly, I mean just like that, not gradually, but quickly. Because if there's anything wrong with the fuel metering equipment or the ignition system, it will show up right then, where a gentle application may conceal it. Anytime you can open that throttle swiftly and smoothly, without hesitation, the oil pressure does not exceed the red line, and all that tells us, red line oil pressure, is that the oil is thin enough to flow where it will lubricate properly. That's why we use it as a reference. Go. Excessive ground run-up and warm-up is unnecessary, and especially in hot weather. Now let's talk about leaning procedures. That's another area where we find a lot of mystery. Before I do that, I want to show you something about combustion chamber behavior again that you can tie into leaning techniques and should make you feel a lot better about it. Let's draw a combustion chamber up here again, 
At this time, we're going to put an exhaust valve in here. The exhaust stack. And I left out the intake valve because it isn't effective in our illustration. That valve, when you're operating at 65% power and above, will reach what we call incandescency, and that's just a word for red hot, or the valve glows. If it's incandescent, that simply means you can see it in the dark. And the valve was designed for that. In fact, it will operate at orange hot conditions, or up around 1,650 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, it doesn't stay that way. As soon as the valve goes down on its seat, it quickly transfers all that heat back to the seat and subsequently through the cylinder head. But while it's open, it does get red hot in high power settings. Nothing bad will happen provided this doesn't happen. These are molecules of oxygen. They're there because the mixture was so lean that by the time all the fuel burned, there was still too much of that left. If all the fuel burns and there's still some oxygen left in a combustion chamber, you now have what we call an oxidizing atmosphere. If the valve is not operating in the incandescency range, which it wouldn't be down here around 45%, then that isn't going to cause any real problem. But since that's too low a power setting to be efficient or provide any speed, this is more realistic in where we normally operate. It could be there then, and then the valve is incandescent. When that valve becomes incandescent, if that oxygen is present, it will combine with a valve just like it does in the presence of water, and you all know how steel will rust in the presence of water. Well, this is a very similar process, except it is a heat oxidation process. And heat is the catalyst, but only when the valve becomes incandescent. That will damage the seat of the valve. Then the valve will rough up, and in time, it will not seal properly. Now, this condition is a gradual thing. It doesn't occur overnight. But it gets worse. And the more of that that happens, the more times this is repeated, the rougher the valve face gets. And that's only a thin line across there anyway. Finally, the valve will start to leak. When that happens, fire can squirt out around that valve during combustion. And where it first starts will be the weakest part, and that's where the valve will burn. It isn't really the lean mixture or different octanes of fuel that burn the valve. It is an oxidizing atmosphere that damages the valve. Then the valve burns because the fire leaks out and it behaves as if you held a cutting torch up there. A valve removed from an engine and looked down upon its head would look instead like this, rather like this. A big crater in it. Some of you no doubt have seen that. That's torching that came from an oxidizing atmosphere, which is the result of too lean a mixture. All aircraft, as a rule, especially high-performance aircraft, have mixture controls, and you're well aware of that. But it's on there for a good reason. And we have a cardinal rule in regards to leaning, and that is the mixture shall never be leaned unless there is a practical advantage to be gained from it. When we say practical advantage, we mean something that is good for the engine. Economy, but only if it doesn't hurt the engine. So let's talk about leaning techniques using an airplane with nothing but a carburetor and a mixture control. No gauges like an exhaust gas temperature gauge or economy mixture indicator, and no fuel flow gauge like on a fuel injection. Just the simplest of controls, the mixture control and the carburetor. I'm going to put some figures and numbers up here on the board, which we'll use later on, some letter designations, and by the time we're finished with this leaning presentation, they'll all tie in. Let's start with super rich, too rich, and for the time being, we'll just use those. Now, during takeoff and high power settings, and when I say high power, mind you, we're always talking about 75% or better, we want the mixture to be in the super-rich conditions. 
And we're going to talk about climb right now. So what I have to say next refers primarily to takeoff and climb. During takeoff, here at sea level, we want the mixture to be in this super rich condition. So you take off with a full rich mixture and the throttle in the full open position. Now when you get up to 400 feet, you level off and start your climb. This would be the 400 foot level. There's no point in doing anything to the mixture until you reach approximately 5,000 feet. And here is another point I'd like to interject at this moment, and that is density altitude. The engine understands only density altitude. So always convert pressure altitude to density altitude in terms of leaning, takeoff, and performance figures, because that's what it responds to. At 5,000 feet, check the mixture, and check it in this manner. Now, I know the manual says to pull the mixture control out and observe a slight rise in RPM. That's difficult at best. There's an easier way. Ease the mixture control out of the full rich position, to our delene position. If you feel the engine start to get smoother as you do that, stop as soon as you can feel that. Because here's what's happened. As you go up in altitude, the mixture heads over here toward this too rich condition due by the decreasing air density. We want to get it back here again, but only here, not any leaner than that. So don't try for the smoothest possible condition. Just try to get rid of the roughness that crept in during the climb, which is a result of this over-rich mixture. Continue that process all the way to cruising altitude. We'll say today we're going to cruise at 10,000 feet. All right, when we get up there at 10,000 feet, we've done this all the way up. Every 2,000 feet, check it. And if it doesn't get smoother when you pull it back toward lean, push it back and forget it. It's not too rich. Remember, we're not trying to save fuel. We're only interested in restoring any lost power and making the engine run smoother because it was running too rough from too rich a mixture and subsequently losing power. That's all we're interested in during the takeoff and climb. And takeoff, below 5,000 feet, should always be with a full rich mixture. Now, mind you, 5,000 density feet, not pressure. Now, let's go back and talk about high altitude takeoff because there will be times, I'm sure, in your career when you're faced with that. Today, we're at 5,000 feet. There's two ways you can start your takeoff here. If the runway is long, like they are at places like Santa Fe, El Paso, Albuquerque, Denver, let the airplane reach maximum RPM, whatever that may be on that particular airplane, and then lean the mixture till you feel the engine get smoother and hold it there. Don't try to make it any better. If the runway is short and you can't do that, and there are plenty of those in places like Colorado and Montana, then hold the brakes, run the engine up to max RPM, whatever that is, on a fixed pitch it won't be maximum. And while it's running at full power and you're holding the brakes, lean the mixture till you feel it smooth out. Just enough to smooth it out. If nothing happened when you pulled it back a little bit, then it wasn't too rich. And if it was too rich, you'll feel the difference. And that's all we're interested in. Don't try to lean for a rise in RPM. It's difficult under those circumstances, and that is much leaner than super rich. You're back in the best power range when you do that. And that isn't what we want for takeoff. This will keep you out of oxidizing atmospheres, and that's the important thing. It's just that simple. Now we're at cruising altitude, 10,000 feet, we'll say. And you want to lean the mixture for economy purposes. And if you did your work right, this is where you've been all the way up. Okay, we have up here now best rich, best power, economy lean, peak lean, and over here, too lean. What we're going to do now is start pulling the mixture control back. And if you could see this on an oscilloscope, the pattern would look like this. Just like that. Notice that it's smoothest right in through here. Gets rough out here and will eventually quit from too rich a mixture, just like it will on too lean a mixture. So you simply pull the mixture control back toward the lean position until you feel it get rough. When it gets rough, stop. All right? Say we're in here someplace. Now, 
advance it back toward the rich position until you feel it gets smooth. You'll be somewhere in this area here, between economy lean and two lean. Or maybe even over here, depending on how well you can sense it. And that's perfectly satisfactory. Here's a way you can check that if you're in doubt. Turn the magneto switch from both to the first one that comes up. We'll say in this case it's right. Switch the magnetos over here after you've leaned the mixture. If the engine experiences only the normal amount of roughness and power loss associated with a mag drop or mag check, it wasn't too lean. But on the other hand, if it gets extremely rough under those circumstances, then it is too lean. And while the magneto is in that position, ease the mixture control back in until it smooths out and you're there. That's it. You can't fold the magnetos. That check is very successful. So if you are in doubt, that's a check you can use to be certain. You can, if you'd like, lean that way by switching the engine or mags from both to right or left, whichever comes up first, it's irrelevant, and then lean the mixture on one mag. Now when you get to the rough part, and that will occur quicker on one mag because combustion efficiency is not quite as good since it's only firing on one side of the combustion chamber. Remember the propagation? Therefore, you'll wind up with a slightly richer mixture. So if you lean this way, this time it would be more like this. And notice it's getting rougher quicker. And when you enrich it, you're going to be over in here somewhere or here. So you have a slightly richer mixture. The engine really likes to run over here if it had its own choice in the matter. And there's no harm. But that isn't the most economical place to run it from a standpoint of cruise range. So this will give you a slightly richer mixture, the mag check. I'd like to give you a word of caution in this regard. Should you inadvertently switch off the magnetos altogether, or the possibility that one mag died sometime after takeoff, and now you discover it, and therefore when you turn it to the first mag up, the engine stops firing. Don't turn it back on immediately. Instead, Pull the throttle back to idle. Reestablish the magnetos to the both position and then reestablish your throttle for the power you had it set for. This is simply to prevent the possibility of a backfire through the carburetor, which could damage the throttle valve or the intake manifold. That's all. And that rule applies any time that should happen, if you were checking the mags in flight or even on the ground. That is leaning in its simplest method. Now, on a fuel injection engine, it's much easier. And all of our engines today are either float-type carburetors, and that's what we just described, or fuel injection. On a fuel injection engine, you have a flow gauge, a fuel flow gauge. It has a red line right here. And during takeoff, the needle should be at or very near the red line. Then there is a white arc here, like this. During climb, the needle should be somewhere in this white arc. Now, we're not talking about turbocharged engines, direct drive engines. Now, once you uh, uh, get to your cruising altitude, where you're going to cruise, you have figures on here, like 75%, 65, 55, 45, so on. You may use those in cruising altitude. These are cruise numbers. not climb, cruise. There you can set the fuel flow for those particular numbers, depending on the power setting you have. It's that simple. That is not the most economical method of doing it, but it can be done that way. A better way is to use the computer that comes with the airplane. Simply set the manifold pressure you've selected opposite the RPM you've selected. Obtain the te temperature differential between what it actually is and what's standard for that altitude. Move the cursor line to that point, and it will tell you exactly what the fuel flow should be, what your endurance is, how many gallons, and so on, that you have left, and what range you're going to get out of the airplane. It's really that simple. That is a very accurate way to adjust the mixture on a fuel injection engine. A word of caution, with the exception of the IO346 used in the early Beach Musketeers that had no fuel flow gauge, do not use that float carburetor method of leaning for a fuel injection engine. The fuel injection engine will permit much leaner 
situations before it starts to get rough. So that's not a very accurate method. Always use the fuel flow gauge. The rules for high altitude takeoff on a fuel injection engine are as I just described. Full rich mixture and above 5,000 feet, the needle should be, and some of them actually have settings on there of altitude levels where you can set the fuel flow gauge. You'll know best when you look at the one on your airplane. Now we get around to the economy mixture indicator, which is just a gauge with graduations of about 25 degree increments like this. And to use this, and we recommend the use of this instrument only in cruise flight, not during takeoff and not during climb, despite what some manuals say that are published by the people that make the instruments. It's this simple. Lean the mixture to peak, and the needle will come all the way over here. That's as high as it will go. Never lean on the lean side of peak. Now select what you want. This is 75 degrees. 50 and 25 on the rich side of peak. So if you want the engine to run its smoothest, this would be best rich. Simply enrich the mixture now until the needle swings all the way back here. If you want best power, it would be here. And finally, economy lean would be here. It's that simple. And remember this, any time the airplane changes altitude or air masses or temperature, you will have to reestablish peak and relean. It really isn't all that complicated. Never really was. There you get an idea of how to do it the easy way and the way it makes the most sense. And remember, fuel economy is not nearly so important as the life of the engine. We see a lot of engines in our remanufacturing center at Mobile, Alabama. Many of those engines have leaning damage that was a result of getting the mixture too lean, especially in the high power ranges where valve incandescency occurs. And remember, too, that we're talking 65% power or better for valve incandescency. So whatever type of system you have, those are the three methods you would use. We have only two left now today, float carburetor and fuel injection. Fuel injection has a flow gauge, making it very easy for you. The carburetor, lean till you feel it get rough, push it back in till it's smooth. If there's any doubts, use the bag check. And on the exhaust gas temperature gauge or economy mixture indicator, use those settings we have given you to determine what you want. If you want the smoothest running engine, 75 degrees, and so on. That concludes part one of this presentation, and thank you very much. The title of this presentation is Care and Feeding of Aircraft Engines, and this is part two. Before we begin, however, I'd like to tell you a little bit about the philosophy of your Federal Aviation Administration. They believe that when they're fortunate enough to get you people to come out and give your time to this presentation, they should give you something useful and worthwhile that you can take home and use. We at Teledyne Continental Motors share that philosophy. And that's exactly what we're going to do in this presentation. There are two subjects that we are going to talk about specifically that you deal with every time you fly your airplane. One of those is fuels and lubricants. And I know you've heard a lot of controversial things about lubricating oil. And in this present state of the art, fuels and what's going to be available in the very near future. And the second one, is probably something of equal interest to you, and that is what you can expect in terms of life from your aircraft engine, and what you can do to help that engine reach its old age, or the TBO that we have promised. My own personal philosophy in this respect is not to just stand here and tell you a lot of things that you should do or not do, but rather to present it to you in a manner that you have something you can take home. I use a teaching philosophy in this and work with a chalkboard in back of me. So let's do just that. We'll go to the chalkboard and begin with fuels. During the past year now, you've probably heard a great deal about gasolines and what's going to be available. And the fact that some gasolines aren't available now, 80 over 87, for example. Well, 
Continental has built to date more than 300,000 reciprocating aircraft on this chalkboard, the different fuels that are available today and what they mean to you. 80 over 87, of course, is probably the most commonly used fuel. And then next to that is a new fuel. Commonly called Avgas. It is a product of Shell. Well, we'll put their name up. Now another fuel that I know you're familiar with. And finally, One fifteen over one forty five. Now that's a fuel that some of you probably haven't heard of, and it's primarily a combat fuel from World War II, and is used in very high performance reciprocating engines. The two fuels, or I should say three really, when we consider this new one, that you are most commonly in contact with is eighty over eighty seven and a hundred over hundred and thirty. There really isn't any harm in using this fuel or this one in an engine designed for this one. The basic difference between these fuels is the amount of tetraethyl lead that's been added to the fuel to raise its octane number and the availability of them. This one, of course, is quite widespread. And as the engines become more and more in the high performance category, it will be more demanded than these other fuels. Now, a petroleum company has in mind an ultimate purpose of one fuel. One fuel that will take care of all engines. There's a lot to be said for that. We still have problems where engines designed for this fuel, 100 octane, are fueled with this fuel, and that will bring on detonation almost immediately. You cannot do that. You can always go up the ladder of octane, but never down. You can always substitute one of these for this one, but you cannot substitute this one for one of these. That is detonation right away. The biggest disadvantage to the use of this fuel in this type of fueled engine is the lead content in the fuel. To give you an idea what we're talking about, I'll show you the amount of lead in each of these fuels. 80 over 87 is one half cubic centimeter per gallon. The new shell av gas has two, 100 over 130, four cubic centimeters. And this fuel, six. If you're at a field, home field or port, where you operate from day by day, and you cannot get this fuel, then we say it's all right to use this one, or even this one. And in some cases, 80 over 87 octane fueled engines are using these fuels, South America, Europe, some aero clubs here in the United States. When this is a necessity, and now mind you, we prefer that if the engine is fueled with 80 over 87 octane, that that's what you use. But if you cannot get it, and you're required to use one of these, then we say simply, every 100 hours, your engine should be subject to a 100-hour inspection by a certificated airframe and power plant mechanic. During that inspection, he will determine whether any harm has come to the engine. There really isn't too much danger of that. The biggest disadvantage, of course, is spark plug fouling, and next to that is the erosive effects at high temperature that these higher lead content fuels have on the exhaust valve stem and the seats. This is most critical when the engine spends a great deal of time in the hangar and is not flying. And then moisture gets in the act and makes it corrosive as well. So when you're faced with that situation, have no fear about using these fuels. But do have a 100-hour inspection performed each 100 hours of the engine's life and by a certificated mechanic. We do not like the use of additives by other than the manufacturer in the fuel. So there they know what they're putting in the gasoline. But there are additives on the market today, especially automotive additives, that you can put in the gasoline. And people do that sometimes. We do not recommend that under any circumstances at all. Do not put additives into the fuel you use in your airplane. And another practice 
that we encounter frequently is the use of automotive fuels in aviation engines, and that really is a no-no. The airplane fuel has only one lead scavenging agent in it. Automotive fuels have two. Aviation fuel is also rated by its volatility. I'll show you what we mean. Volatility is the fuel's ability to vaporize and become a gas, a dry gas, and that's what it must do before it can actually burn. The vapor pressure of aviation gasoline is held consistently at 7 PSI the year around. There are no grades of summer, winter stock, and that sort of thing like there is in automotive fuels. 7 PSI the year around. Automobile fuels start at 9 PSI and go all the way to 14 and a half. Well, you can see 9 is already 2 pounds higher than aviation fuel. In addition to that, automotive fuels have additives in them that work to clean the automobile engine, and that's desirable. Phosphates, for example. Those particular agents are extremely detrimental to the exhaust valve and the turbine wheel of turbocharged engines when they reach incandescent temperatures. And the exhaust valve operates in an incandescent state any time the power is above 65%. That's also true of the turbine wheel. On the, under those conditions, phosphates will attack the valve and the wheel. They are not used in aviation gasolines. And then, of course, in many cases, you have no way of knowing exactly what the octane number is on automotive fuel. We do not recommend it under any circumstances. I've had it said or asked of me on several occasions, what if I had an emergency? Better weigh that carefully. The use of automotive fuels could create an even greater emergency than the one you already have. It's better to stay there overnight if you have to, until aviation fuel can be brought out if you had such a situation, and to take a chance on using it under any circumstances. Next, we get into the subject of lubricating oils, and that is highly controversial. I'm going to break it down for you and show you the different categories of oils, what we use them for, and what we recommend. First of all, there's only one type of oil, as far as we are concerned, and that is petroleum, or more commonly, mineral oil. Let's put it down that way. Mineral oil is simply petroleum oil. It breaks down now in two additional categories, non-compounded and compounded. So we'll put that little tree up here next. Now non-compounded means that it does not contain the super lubricants and special additives that a compounded oil does, and the cleaning agents that a compound oil has, like detergent. Compounded oils break down into two more categories. Detergent, and you're familiar with that. You've used that in your automobile for many years. And a new one, only in aviation. I'm abbreviating a lot of these things because these words can get carried out quite a bit. This is commonly called ashless dispersant. Now we'll come back to this group of oils in a few minutes. Well, let's go back to our non-compounded mineral oil because that's what the engine starts out its life with. This is a viscosity number, and all oils are rated that way by viscosities. First of all, before we talk about this, Let's clear the air on this viscosity index bit because there's three different ways that these oils are rated. And I frequently encounter this confusion myself and people who have never been told otherwise and just don't understand what they should put in the engine because of these numbers. The Society of Automotive Engineers, or commonly called SAE, gives the oil its rating. And so if the oil was SAE 50, 
This is its viscosity index number. Some time ago, when aviation was in its fledgling state, this oil was given a civil aviation number of 100. Well, grade 100, as they call it. Mind you, this is SAE 50. This is grade. So it will always be preceded with the word grade or the letter G. So if it's 50, it, it will have SAE preceding it. So 100 weight or grade oil is the same as SAE or 50 weight oil. And then there is the military version of that yet, and they add a thousand. So if you had this oil here, I beg your pardon, it's 1100. If you had this, it's mill spec oil. So mill spec oil of 1100 is simply grade 100 or SAE 50. Really, it would have been much simpler if we would have stayed with the SAE 50, but that's a story on that. Well, let's talk about this viscosity index for a minute, and there's two different types of viscosities that we're going to discuss. One is straight. When we say non-compounded oil or straight mineral oil, straight means the viscosity index number is just that. It could be 50, 40, 30. Then there is a malta this oil, malta viscosity. For example, 10, W, 30. Now that oil has the same property or qualities that this oil does, plus it gives you the capability of 10 weight oil in starting the engine. So in starting a cold engine, this oil in the engine's crankcase or sump will behave like cold 10 weight oil. But when the oil warms up and thins out like all oil does, this one won't do that to that degree. And therefore, under warm conditions, it will be the equivalent of 30 weight oil. So it gives you the starting capability of 10 weight oil and it runs at 30 weight viscosity index. That oil is approved in all of our engines. And I'll come back to that because that is generally only found in a compounded oil. Back to the non-compounded oil now. When the engine leaves the factory, it has a straight viscosity non-compounded oil in the engine sump or crankcase. We recommend the use of that type oil for the first 50 to 100 hours. The owner's manual say, uh, or until oil consumption has stabilized. And by that we mean that after a period of time you notice that the engine is not using more oil or less oil, the oil consumption is pretty stable. Say a quart every three hours and it never changes. Now you know it's stabilized. And now you can switch. But this is what it starts life on, is a non-compounded and straight viscosity oil. Now we'll move over to the compounded oils. Give you a little background on these because I believe it helps. When the war was over, the automotive industry wanted an oil that they could use in an automobile engine. An oil that would keep the engine clean. And the compounded oil is the only one that does that. They went to the petroleum industry, expressed their needs, and the industry set out to develop an oil. And when they achieved it, it was called detergent. This oil is really an anti-precipitant dispersant type of oil. Anti-precipitant dispersant. Well, that means that the dirt won't precipitate down out of the oil when it's at rest, like it does on a non-compounded oil. Uh, dirt mixed with a straight mineral oil is strictly a mechanical mixture, and it stays in the oil only while the engine is running and stirring the oil up. When the engine is at rest and the oil is at rest, the dirt will gradually filter or precipitate out of the oil and collect in such places as oil galleries, hydraulic lifters, propeller mechanisms, and so on. And that, of course, is undesirable. That's one of the reasons why we always recommended changing the oil while the engine is hot, right after you've run it up. But it's a different story with an anti-precipitant dispersant oil. But as you listen, imagine how difficult that is to drive up to a filling station and say, I'd like to have a quart of anti-precipitant dispersant oil. 
and it's, it's silly. Since the oil keeps the engine clean, they call it detergent. That was a good idea, and that is right about the time when soaps were replaced with detergents, and if you didn't use a detergent, you simply weren't wearing clean clothing. It caught, and it was a good marketing idea. Then the Shell people, as time went on, decided that aviation engines should have their own oil. One specifically designed and compounded for the aviation engine. It, too, is a dispersant oil. And what happened here, the additives used in this detergent oil were metallic additives by nature. Metallic additives. Now, they reasoned that if we could eliminate those metallic additives with a non-metallic type additive, and the reason, of course, is the, the higher operating temperature of an air-cooled aviation engine, and the feeling that these oils with their metallic additives might cause incipient pre-ignition, well, then we should have a better oil. And so they came up with ashless dispersant. The term ashless, because there is no metallic ash residue, and that's what these oils had. Now, I don't want to leave you with the impression that these are not good for your automobile engine because they are, and they're also approved for aviation engines. We have run approval tests on all the existing uh, name brand detergent oils as well as the ashless dispersant. However, this oil is still quite new, and it's going to be a while before all the different companies have it. So that presents a problem. The term ashless simply means that you don't get metallic ash residue from this oil. Both oils are anti-precipitant dispersant oils. So, since they're both approved, you're probably wondering, and in some cases I'm sure you've been told, never mix the two. Bad things will happen. And that really isn't true. In fact, we run tests in our test house with mixtures of all three. The straight mineral oil, detergent, and the ashless dispersant with no oil effects. Now, we're not advocating that you operate your engine with this Duke's mixture, if you will, of all these different oils in it. Not at all. In fact, you should pick a name brand oil and stay with it. Some pilots even carry a few extra quarts in the baggage locker of the airplane in the event that they do land somewhere and they can't get their favorite brand. However, let's use an actual situation where you're flying cross-country in a brand new airplane. You land at an airport, they check the oil, which is routine, and it's a few quarts low, and you should add oil. Yeah, they don't have the oil there, and your engine's new and it's still running on the straight mineral oil, and all they have are these oils. By all means, put it in. The engine will like it a whole lot better than taking off on a low oil level, and it's not going to cause any problems. They mix. They mix well enough that there won't be any difficulties whatsoever. And the real difficulty is running the engine low on oil. When you get around to where oil consumption stabilizes, then you switch to these. Again, the same thing could happen. And you'd have to put straight mineral in with these. And again, it isn't going to cause any problems, and it's better than the alternative of too low an oil level. Let me show you how these wells work now. This, by the way, is a molecule of oil. And I always thought they were round, too, but they're not. They're shaped like a wet noodle and just about as slippery, probably more so. The additive in the factory, the anti or dis, uh, dispersant additive, behaves in this manner. It repels anything that is foreign to that oil. And so anything that wasn't in that can of oil when it left the factory is foreign to the oil as far as this dispersant is concerned. Also attached to that molecule of oil is an anti-precipitant additive. And it attracts. And so as the dirt is chased around in the oil by the dispersant and comes in contact with the anti-precipitant, it attracts it. It's that simple. That's how it works. When that anti-precipitant is completely loaded with dirt, it's saturated. That means that it won't hold any more dirt, and it's time to drain the oil. Now, I know you've heard the old story, oil never wears out. 
In fact, there was even a government bulletin to that effect one time. That's no longer true. The atomic energy age has brought such things to us as the electron microscope, where we can examine things as we never saw them before. And in examining oil used in an engine, we discovered that it was subject to things like shearing damage, where this molecule is cut in half. Well, that, you can see, changes its whole structure and subsequently its behavior in the engine. And then, too, the oil is subjected to very high temperatures. That's how the pistons are cooled in an engine. Oil sprayed on the pistons carries away the excess heat. And any time oil is exposed to heat in excess of 300 degrees Fahrenheit, it's damaged. It oxidizes under those conditions. Well, the piston operates at a higher temperature than that. And so the oil is subject to those temperatures and does, indeed, get damaged. There's a very fancy word that the petroleum industry has to describe this. They say the oil's fixotropic properties have suffered. What that means to you and me is that it just isn't anymore what it once was. And when that case comes, it's time to drain it. So oil should and must be drained if you're going to get the service out of that engine that it's supposed to give you. Your owner's manual will tell you best when to do that because oil drain periods vary from one engine type to another and whether or not the engine has a filter and various other factors that influence this. And we can't really establish that accurately enough in the test house. That is best determined in actual customer usage and then we get the information from our airframe manufacturers, from the carcasses or run-out engines that we get back at Mobile, Alabama, where they are remanufactured, and so on. There is another thing you should know, and that is mixing viscosity indexes. Now, we run into that every now and then, where I've had people tell me, you know, my engine's supposed to have 40 weight oil, and I can't get it. So what I do is take 50 weight oil, and add some 10, and I feel like that gives me 40. You know what that's like? That's like taking baseballs and marbles and mixing them up in a bucket with the idea that golf balls will come out. It's ridiculous. You're right when you laugh. You cannot do that. Oil viscosity is determined by Mother Nature and we arrive at it with a thing called a fractionating tower at the refinery. You, you just can't create that, and certainly not by mixing oils. And so don't do that. Get the correct grade of oil. While we're on its subject, it isn't difficult at all to remember for your engine what its needs are. This 40 degrees Fahrenheit is almost like a magic number. We at Continental use that for a great many things in regards to engine operation. That's the dividing line. I'm going to put one band of engines on one side and the other opposite. All engines from the A65 up through the IO346 fall on this side of the line. They use SAE40 above 40 degrees Fahrenheit and 20 below. That's simple. You're only talking about two different grades of oil. It's either 40 or 20. Now, the coming of most of this quantity oils made it possible to have a 10W20 for this engine below 40 degrees. And that is a lot better because this is 20 weight oil, period. But this oil is 20 weight oil and it gives you the starting capability of 10 weight oil. So it, it is in effect even thinner in a crankcase when you go out to start the engine. It means you'll get started in a lot colder weather than with straight 20. We ran these oils in all of our engines under grueling hot weather temperature tests, so you have no fear that it will harm the engine. On the other side of this center line are the 0470 series engines, and they go all the way up to the big geared turbo supercharged engines. And that, again, is one oil above, which is SAE 50, 
and below that is 30. And again, we now have a 10W30 and the behavior of 10W30 in this engine is the same as I explained over here. That's all you have to remember. Your specific engine, and whether it falls in this category or this one, and that above 40, you use the heavy oil, and below 40, you use the thin oil. That's simple. Now, you've probably heard a lot about the additives, and we do not recommend the use of oil additives in any of our engines and for any reasons. And I know there are a lot of additives and a lot of good things said about them. Our philosophy is they not only are not necessary, but in some cases they could be harmful. For example, maybe, maybe the anti-precipitant additive that attracts, maybe it'll like the additive better than the dirt, and it'll release the dirt and hold the additive. Then you lost the cleaning power of the oil. Besides, the thing that worries us most about them is not only that they do not or are not necessary, but it's that age-old philosophy that we have, myself included, that if a little does so much good, think what a lot would do, and we put in too much. The funny part about that is we never use that philosophy on x lax but if you do it on oil, it's bad news. And then there's another thing I know you've heard, and that is in regards to engines that have run a long period of time on one oil, and now you want to switch to another. Now, there is some truth in some of that rumor. Let's talk about specifically what that is. We'll use a case in uh, fact with an 0470 engine, which is a very common engine. We'll say this engine has been running now for about 800 hours on a straight mineral oil. We'll put the letters up here, NC, which means non-compounded. You're asking the question now, can I switch to an oil that will keep the engine clean? Yes, but it must be an AD oil. An engine that has that much time on it should not be switched over to a detergent oil. Detergent oils, remember, were originally automotive oils, and they're very harsh when it comes to cleaning up the engine. Those kind of oils can clean the engine up too quickly, and if they do, they can cause dirt ingression in places like oil galleries, hydraulic lifters, propeller governors, propeller pitch changing mechanisms, and subsequently some serious problems. You could think of it in these terms. The use of those detergent oils in a high time engine that's been running on mineral oil is about like a overdose of castor oil would be to you. Only you'll get well. Don't make that switch with a detergent oil. Use ashless dispersant if you're going to do that. It will clean the engine up in time, but not rapidly and severely like a detergent oil will. Then there's a subject of oil filters, and I'm sure that's crossed your mind many times, and we do recognize the use of an oil filter, and it's an excellent piece of equipment if the engine is approved for it, and usually the airframe manufacturer runs that approval because that's a piece of equipment that he generally installed. Oil filters, in most cases, will not extend the oil drain period by any appreciable amount, but they do keep the oil cleaner, and they definitely do help in promoting the life of the engine. To sum this all up now, we recommend a non-dispersant type oil, or simply a straight mineral oil for the first 50 to 100 hours until oil consumption stabilizes. Now you can see, if I were to tell you that those dispersant oils have anywhere from three to five times the film strength of a straight mineral oil, what that would do in terms of break-in. Contrary to popular belief, the oil used in break-in should not be a super lubricant, but in fact, an oil where the film ruptures more easily to get that metal-to-metal -metal contact between piston, ring, and cylinder wall during break-in. Well, then those super lubricant oils would work against you under those circumstances. 
So do operate for the first 50 to 100 hours on a straight viscosity mineral oil. After that time, change to a dispersant oil. You'll be ahead in the game. Either detergent or ashless dispersant are approved. Of course, ashless dispersant is now taking the place of detergent oil and eventually will supersede it entirely. Those oils will keep the engine clean, and a clean engine is a much healthier engine. And do drain the oil at the recommended periods. In fact, the book says the drain period or as often as necessary in extreme dusty areas, for example, aerial application, it may be necessary more often than the recommended drain period we give. And finally, do not use super lubricants or additives. They aren't necessary. We feel that in some cases they're detrimental. And to put it simply, where additives are concerned, the, the money that you would have spent for the additive can be spent better by taking your wife out to dinner someplace. Her and the engine will both love you for it and you'll be ahead in the game. Now we get around to another subject that worries a lot of pilots and that's TBO. And I've heard a lot of confusion about that in the past few years. First of all, what do those letters mean? TBO, time between overhaul. That's all it means, time between overhaul. But before we talk about that, let's define overhaul because there are two overhauls. There is, we'll put a little tree up here again, the letters. You see this in such things as trade plane and various other aviation publications, so many hours since TOH. That means top overhaul. That is piston ring and valve service only. The engine remains intact and has not been taken apart. Then there is MOH, and you see that too, time between MOH. Well, it stands for major overhaul. That means that the engine has been completely disassembled, cleaned, inspected, and all the parts replaced that were worn. That's an entirely different overhaul. When we at the factory refer to time between overhaul, this is what we're talking about. Not this figure at all. We're talking about the major overhaul. And when we say this engine will get, and we'll use an IO520 for example, twelve hundred hours between overhaul, we mean this figure. We're talking about major overhaul, not top overhauls. It is true that sometimes an engine will have to have a top overhaul before it reaches that 1,200 hours. And then you're faced with such an experience. Again, the top overhaul is piston ring and valve service. But there are some things that can cause that to happen ahead of time. One of those is too much time in the hangar. That's right, hangar queen. The engine will deteriorate quicker doing nothing than it will when it's operating. Well, that's often hard for the customer to accept, and especially if he's faced with a top overhaul and this engine has only 600 hours on it. He feels like it was promised to me at 1,200 hours. Well, this isn't really a guarantee. We don't guarantee that engine will get 1,200 hours. We know from experience that under ideal operating conditions, which include proper maintenance, oil drain, and so on, that the engine generally will deliver 1,200 hours between major overhauls. But there are factors that can cause it to require a top overhaul before it ever gets that far along, and you, the pilot and owner, control that. So let's examine some of them, and then we'll come back to this. Going back now to hangar time, when the airplane is sitting in the hangar, rust is its biggest enemy, rust and corrosion. It's at rest, not working. Now the oil, looking at a cylinder wall, right through the cylinder wall, will eventually run down off these walls and collect down here. And looking at the cylinder wall from a side view, the oil back of the piston will run out into the crankcase, drain out. 
That leaves nothing up here on these walls for protection. Within a week, seven days, sufficient oil will have drained off those walls to expose them to scuffing damage when the engine started. By that we mean metal to metal contact. That isn't any real serious consequence, but every time that happens, it shames that TBO a little bit. So if the airplane spends a great deal of time in the hangar and is operated only occasionally, all those starts gradually whittle away at that 1,200 hours. It won't have too much bearing on the time between major overhauls, but it sure does bring on, ahead of time, a top overhaul, the piston ring and valve service, because it's wearing the cylinders. During the period that the engine starts and it's running until oil is pumped back through the engine and circulated on the walls, that happens as soon, in fact, before you even see oil pressure on the gauge. It doesn't take long. It's only a matter of seconds. But nevertheless, dry metal against dry metal, no matter how smooth it is, will wear. Minute, yes, but it does add up in terms of reducing the TBO before it's time. If the engine stands for two weeks in the hangar without running, sufficient oil has drained off these walls now and evaporated to where they are now no longer protected against rust. And that is a steel cylinder wall. Moisture in the atmosphere, contacting the exposed polished steel cylinder wall will cause rust. In time, with repeated conditions such as that, the rust will have penetrated deeply enough to wear the cylinders worn out ahead of time. And now instead of 1,200 hours, that sort of condition could net you 600. That could have been prevented, and it's easy. If the engine is flowing for 30 minutes a week at cruise power, it won't happen. The walls will never get dry to the point where scuffing damage occurs and certainly to the point where rust and corrosion take their toll. If you saw part one of this program, we mentioned blow-by, combustion gases that get past the piston rings, even on a healthy engine, and especially when the engine's at low power when it first started from a cold condition and during taxiing and idling and slow power or slow flight conditions. Those gases contain five basic acids, all of them highly corrosive. However, they're dry, or antihydrous, as the engineers call them, in their natural state. When the engine is at rest, those acids are in the oil. They get in there and mix with the oil. And when the engine is at rest, water vapor in the air then mixes with the acids to produce a highly corrosive material. It isn't too effective against the areas where there's oil, like the crankshaft bearings, camshaft bearings. But the exposed surfaces, like cylinder walls, it is very effective. And valves, for example, that are unprotected during that time. And, and remember, the valve is in a very dry area to start with, the upper part of the combustion chamber. So you invite that kind of damage. And here's a little experiment you can conduct for yourself. Open an oil can, a metal oil can, that the oil has been poured out of, and cut one end out of it, and let it stand somewhere in your garage or home for a week. At the end of that week, run your finger along the top of the can, which is, and when I said stand, let me correct that. Lay the can down on its side like a cylinder. At the end of a week's time, run your finger across the top, and notice how much oil you get off on your finger. At the end of two weeks, do it again. It'll make a believer out of you. So the best protection is to fly the engine at least once a week at 30 minutes cruise power. Now there's a time-honored practice of running the engine on the ground. I know a lot of people do this and believe in it. That is to go out and pull the airplane out of the hangar and run the engine up for 10 minutes once a week or once a month. That does put lubricating oil back on the cylinder walls, and it does eliminate the scuffing possibilities if it's done once a week. However, every time you do that, you introduce more water into the lubricating oil. Each time you start the engine up, you create water vapor from the rapid temperature change within the engine of all the metal parts. 
And then when the engine cools down, it happens again. As I told you in uh, part one of care and feeding, we like to leave it up to you and give you something you can believe and see for yourself. So try this experiment the next time you're going out to fly your bird. Take the oil cap off during the pre-flight and examine it. Put it back on. Start the engine and run it for about 10 minutes, or the time that you feel you would normally run it to get the oil circulated if it were in storage. 10 minutes is usually the adequate amount that most people use. More than that's unnecessary. Now shut the engine down and go out and examine the oil cap again. It'll make a believer out of you. It'll be saturated with water droplets. And mind you, that's just the oil cap. The whole inside of the engine will look like that. Think about that water. As it goes down through the oil, it mixes with the acid. Now the acid is no longer dry or antihydrous, and in its wet state, it is very corrosive. So you see, that really isn't the answer. Running the engine up for a few minutes, 10 minutes, once a week, will in fact circulate the lubricating oil and keep the walls wet with oil. But it gradually increases the acidity of the oil the acid content, because every time you do it, you get more blow-by gases, lots of them under those conditions, and more water. And along the sea coast and Gulf Coast, or inland along the lake regions, it's much worse. The people in El Paso, Las Vegas, Albuquerque have the edge on you where it's much drier, but even they aren't free of the problem. So what I'm saying is that isn't an alternative. Well, that only leaves one other thing, and there are some people that do that. And they ask, well, how about if I pull the prop through every week for a few times? All right, if you can get it up to 1,200 RPM and keep it there for three or four minutes, you're laughing, and I agree with you, it's ridiculous. You can't do that. So that isn't practical either. What does that leave me, you say? fly the airplane. Now I know that that probably isn't what you wanted to hear, and we don't like to have to say things like that either. We want you to enjoy the airplane, get all out of it you can, but the present state of the art in terms of metals are such that that's what it's made out of. The materials we build the engine from today are the best materials available. We still don't know how to build a steel for engine purposes that doesn't rust valves that won't corrode under these circumstances. That is the biggest enemy of your engine, is hangar time. The engines that enjoy full-range TBOs are the ones that operate frequently. The most healthy airplanes, believe it or not, are those used in flight training schools, in air taxi service, and that sort of thing, where they're operating on a daily basis. Now, you don't have to operate your engine on a daily basis, but you should operate it at least once a week. If you can't fly the airplane every week, surely you have a pilot friend that you can trust. Check him out in the airplane. Between the two of you, it should be possible. There's another factor, too, and that's inadequate oil drain. That, too, takes its toll of the TBO. There are many pilots that believe that by putting additives in the oil or special kinds of oil filters, that now the oil doesn't have to be drained. That simply isn't true. As I explained to you earlier, temperature damage to the oil in the form of oxidation, which tends to thicken it, and shearing damage to the oil from the heavy pressures of the metal parts in high-performance engines change the oil's structure and subsequently its lubricating behavior. Those two factors alone are worth changing the oil. And then don't forget dirt. Dirt, acid, moisture, those kind of contaminants. And filters do not take out acids. It's true there are some filters on the market that take water out. But only when the engine's running, because that's the only time oil is circulating through those filters. And then when you shut the engine down, what about the water that forms again? How will the filter remove that? Because it's not in operation when the engine's not in operation. The cheapest maintenance you can get is good clean oil. And then there's air filler maintenance. 
That air filter is vitally important. When you consider that one teaspoonful of dust can successfully dust gut an engine and take away its performance in life. We have seen air filters on engines that about all they did was keep out small birds and rocks. And that's ridiculous. An air filter is seldom good for more than 300 hours. And therefore, it should be replaced if there's any doubt in your mind at all. And then there's such things as timing, spark plugs. They, too, have their effect. So while too much time in the hangar is number one culprit in terms of reducing your engine's TBO, so is inadequate maintenance, inadequate oil drain, and the things that were put in there in the beginning to help you get that life. And then finally, we see the results of leaning damage. If you saw the first part where we discussed leaning, you realize what an oxidizing atmosphere is now and how it can come into being. It is a thing that doesn't suddenly happen or the pilot isn't even aware that it's going on. But when it happens, it definitely starts to take life off the engine's valves. That can bring on one of these numbers. Excessive leaning at high power, especially when the engine's operating in the incandescency range because that's where it usually happens. Very little damage occurs to the engine in excessive lean temp uh, leaning mixtures below 65% power where valve incandescency doesn't exist. So it's in those high power ranges where leaning does its damage, but nevertheless, we see more than we'd like to see of this kind of damage coming back in the engines that we receive at Mobile, Alabama to overhaul. Most of these factors I've just discussed, time in the hangar, inadequate maintenance, excessive leaning damage, do not have near the bearing on major overhaul as they do on a top overhaul. So let's explore this situation. You're the owner of an airplane, a 200 mile an hour airplane, at least at cruise, with a 1200 hour TBO engine. When the engine has 600 hours on it, your mechanic tells you it's got to have a top overhaul. Now mind you, that's not a major overhaul, but a top overhaul. Naturally, you feel distressed over this because it's going to cost money, money that you feel perhaps isn't necessary. Shouldn't have been, because after all, isn't the engine rated at $1,200? It is rated at $1,200, but we're talking this figure, remember that. Well, this probably isn't going to make you deliriously happy over it, but here's something to think about. We'll take an airplane, like a Cessna 210 or a Beach Bonanza, which cruises well over that 200 mile an hour figure. Consider this for a moment. How many stock automobile engines have you ever seen that will deliver 120,000 miles between ring and valve service at 65 to 75 percent power? Now you may not be aware of this, but if you own a 200 horsepower stock automobile, when I say stock I mean Detroit built cars that are assembly line cars, not hopped up or special cars. If you own a stock automobile with an engine of at least 200 horsepower, it rarely sees valve incandescency or that kind of power. In fact, such an automobile will tool along on a turnpike at 70 miles an hour on approximately 40% power. You just can't use 65 and 75% power in that engine for any prolonged period of time. If you did, there would be red lights and they wouldn't be on the instrument panel. They'd be in back of you. They wouldn't be your tail lights either. So the local speed laws keep you from ever getting up in those situations. So those engines do not operate in this power range. Think about that, 120,000 miles between ring and valve service. That really isn't so bad. The 600 hours 
is nearly half of the engine's life. You still have another 600 hours between major. When the engine finally does get around to 1,200 hours, we frequently have people tell us about engines that are operating in perfect health and there's nothing wrong with them and they want to know, do they have to overhaul it? This isn't a mandatory FAA requirement and it isn't a mandatory Teledyne Continental requirement. It is simply a suggested overhaul. You can continue operation of the engine on a 100-hour basis for as long as your mechanic finds that it is functioning normal and oil consumption has not increased. I think that I could sum up both parts of this presentation by saying simply, take care of your engine and it will always take care of you. Before I go now, I would like to say once more, on behalf of the Federal Aviation Agency and all the men and women in the GATO programs, and for the men and women of Teledyne Continental Motors, we appreciate you're giving us the time and opportunity to help you enjoy flying more and to get more out of your engine. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very, very much.